A couple of nights ago, I was home alone, sitting by my kitchen counter, scrolling down social media posts aimlessly on my laptop. It was another one of my typically boring, yet leisurely weekend nights. I live alone, and am not into social life, which is definitely why I am still single in my early 30s. I checked the time, 10pm, time to get ready for bed, when a sudden knock on my front door shocked me so much that I almost spilled my night tea onto my laptop. XXPD, we are here answering an emergency call from this residence. Please open the door. What the? But I didn't make an emergency call. Baffled, I quickly made it to the front door and pulled it open. Uh, good evening officers. I'm sorry, but you've probably made a mistake. I didn't make an emergency call. I offered an awkward smile while speaking. The two officers outside, on the other hand, did not seem upset by my clarification at all. One of them introduced themselves. Hello ma'am, I'm Officer Blythe and this is my partner Officer Duchamp. Interestingly, they were wearing the name tags on their uniforms, so I got to see their full names, Rainer Blythe and Greg Duchamp. We received a call from this address. The female caller claimed to hear the crawling sound of a large animal on the second floor while she was in the living room. Do you live alone ma'am? Is there another woman in your house? Officer Blythe went on to ask. His gaze, moving away from my face, to the stairs between my kitchen and living room, leading up to the unlit hallway on the second floor. No, I live here alone, and am alone tonight. I really didn't hear anything abnormal, and I certainly didn't make or hear anyone make an emergency call. Are you sure you're at the right address? I was getting more and more confused. Is this your address? Yes, but I did not know what to say. They had the right address. My discomfort was turning into slight fear at that moment. Well, ma'am, looks like we'll have to come in and check on things. You might have been entertaining some unwanted guests this whole evening, Officer Blythe said half-jokingly, exchanging a look with his partner that almost felt like a silent chuckle. Already disturbed, I did not appreciate their bordering flippant attitude. But then, I looked at the wild darkness behind them in front of my forlorn house, and somehow told myself maybe to have these policemen do a check for me would not be the worst idea. Relax ma'am, we're pretty sure it'll turn out to be nothing. Maybe the caller herself offered the wrong address. We'll just take a quick look around to confirm everything and move on. Officer Duchamp finally spoke, taking a large step forward, inviting himself inside my doorway, forcing me to step aside. Officer Blythe followed suit naturally. They went straight for the second floor. I turned on all the lights for them. They checked everywhere, even used their flashlights to look under the beds and outside the windows. After finding nothing, they left. From my porch, I watched their figures dissolve into the dark, realizing I did not see a police car. Maybe they had parked somewhere else nearby, but the thing is, I did not go on to hear any engines starting or see any headlights appear in the vicinity either. A chilling wind reminded me to go back inside. I returned to my laptop not knowing what to make of this incident. I was more than just weirded out. I was somehow deeply disturbed. Something was not right here. The content of the alleged emergency call itself was already creepy enough. Even without finding anything wrong in my house. Not to mention the fact that the police officers themselves were also very out of the norm. Suspicious even. First, they did not seem to have a car. Second, they both looked ruffled. I know police work is supposed to be rough, 
and one should always expect an officer and their uniform to come across as a bit worn. But those two almost looked like they had been out there in the elements as fugitives in police uniforms for quite a while. So, are they actually non-police pranksters? Middle-aged pranksters? Was this whole incident some elaborate yet harmless prank? I probably need to call the police. The real police. To see if they have these two in their department. Running all these thoughts in my head, I half-mindedly typed the two officers' names into the search engine. Maybe their names would pop up in a digital roster, or something like that from the local police website. Shockingly, their names did pop up together on the very first entry of the search results. It was no police roster though. It was not even related to the police. It was an article, a story to be more precise, from a blog about occult stuff, urban legends, and unsolved real-life crimes. The article was published five years ago, and the title read, Where did Officer Rainer Blythe and Officer Greg Duchamp go after the last mission? Answering an emergency call regarding a malicious crawling figure on the second floor of a residence in a wooded area. Two things simultaneously ensued that I immediately got down to reading the story and that a knot formed in my stomach. Not just because this freak incident kept getting more ominous with more content, but also because the address of the residence in the wooded area was exactly the same as mine. Okay, I'm not transcribing the whole article here. I will just give you a synopsis. One night about nine years ago, four years ago from the article's author's perspective, Officer Blythe and Officer Duchamp came to this address to answer an emergency call placed by the female owner of the residence. The caller, named Laurie Randall, stated while watching TV in her living room. She heard the clear sound of something probably a large animal, crawling in the hallway upstairs. Upon checking, she found blood trails on the stairs leading up to the second floor. Not daring to go upstairs, she called the police for help. The officers arrived at the house and the woman was waiting for them on the porch. She looked like she was about to go into hysteria, but the police quickly calmed her down. She then told them she was 52, living alone and had no doubts that there was something very malicious and dangerous in her house, and that she dared not go back inside. The officers asked Laurie to stay put on the porch and entered the house by themselves. They got to the stairs and instantly saw a blood trail on them. The trail only reached halfway down the stairs, like something was originally heading downstairs but changed his mind halfway and went back up. Guns drawn, the officers then followed the trail onto the second floor, covered the entire hallway, and entered the bathroom at the end. The blood trail made them believe it must have been a predator dragging its bloody prey around. Except that they failed to notice any claw print in or near the trail. Even more unnervingly, they found shapes in the trail that resembled prints of a human hand. After getting inside the bathroom, they quickly noticed the window was left wide open and that the blood trail was heading outside. So maybe the crawler originally accessed the interior through this window and after having somehow decided not to move downstairs, climbed out through the same window. The officers shone their flashlights out the window and inspected the surface of the outside wall. To their surprise, the blood trail continued neither upward toward the roof nor downward toward the ground. Instead, it went horizontally along the surface of the wall toward the front side of the house. The whole scene was so bizarre and creepy 
neither officer could come up with a plausible explanation on the spot. They decided to head down outside for further inspection. They were expecting to see Laurie on the porch when they opened the front door, but there was not a soul outside. The surrounding area was pitch black. Where could she have possibly gone? They called out for her, but the passing wind carried no reply. Speculating she had been taken by whatever predator or entity that was visiting the residence, the officers were on full alarm. However, before they could take any further action, a cold, gooey droplet landed on one of the officers' face, and a few more followed onto their faces and shoulders. The officers looked at each other and saw it was blood on their faces and shoulders. They tensed and looked up in unison to the porch ceiling. But whatever they saw ended the story right then and there. And very likely, the two officers as well. There was no sighting of sources, nor any attempt at proving the veracity of the story. Anybody else running into this article would just call it out as another lame urban legend wannabe. But not me. Not with all these matching details. The address, the officers' names, and the content of the call. And I was starting to believe there might actually have been some crawling entity in my house. But it was already very late when I finished reading the article, and I really wanted to go to bed. So I told myself to calm down and decided I was definitely going to check with the police department and also give my real estate agency a call the next day. After that, I went to bed. Sleep did not come easily, and when it did come, it was disrupted by a sudden burst of frantic shouting outside my house. Oh God, please send help. Oh my God, there's blood. So much blood on the stairs. I can't go back inside. Please send someone, now. It was a woman. I jumped out of my bed and bolted across the bedroom floor to the window, not even putting on slippers. I leaned close to the window pane to look down at my porch. I had left the porch light on, but of course, all I could see from up there was only the roof. However, I could still hear the woman's voice, albeit not clearly. Her voice was much lower now. I failed to make out exactly what she was saying, but I thought she was reporting her address. A short while later, everything went dead silent. What the hell? How am I supposed to process this? Adrenaline simmered down and I started to realize how exhausted I really was. I needed to go back to sleep. Maybe everything that happened earlier had left such an imprint on my psyche that I was hallucinating the woman's voice. Sleep came once more, yet failed to last, just like before. I woke up in the middle of the night again, this time, not due to any noise. One minute I was still in a deep slumber, and the next I was wide awake, standing on my porch, in pajamas staring at the stark night and shivering in the cold wind. What's happening? I don't understand. Did I sleepwalk here? I felt like I was in a lucid dream, or maybe I was. I turned around and found my front door ajar. I immediately pushed it open to go back inside, but was petrified by what welcomed me in the hallway. It was a standing corpse of a middle-aged woman, glassy-eyed, ashen-skinned, with the entire throat removed, shredded and torn away. The mutilation did not stop at her neck, but went all the way down to her groin. She basically had a canal dug out of her front torso, flooding the surrounding areas of her body with blood. Red droplets were dripping down her fingertips and the edges of her clothes. I was just standing there, frozen with fear, gawking at the emotionless face of the corpse. 
the stillness was finally broken by the corpse coming back to life. Trembling as if in agony, it slowly crouched and then leaned forward into a crawling position. Taking zero notice of its paralyzed observer, it rigidly turned around on all fours and crawled its way deeper into the house. Still a statue by the doorway, I watched the thing going straight to the stairs and ascending into the darkness on the second floor, leaving behind an ungodly trail of blood, like a warming slug from hell leaving behind a trail of crimson mucus. The next thing I knew, I was waking up in my bedroom with the morning sunlight spilling through the window. It was a fine day, but my head was hurting and I felt anything but well rested. The realization that the woman from the previous night was just a dream, a nightmare, failed to put me at ease by any means. She was probably the house owner featured in the article I had read the night before. Maybe my brain had gotten inspired by the article and conjured up the nightmare. Or maybe the story in the article was real and the woman was actually paying me a visit in my dreams as a paranormal entity. If so, I did not know what to make of it. I took a shower, had some breakfast, and called my real estate agency. I already knew my house was three years old. It had replaced an older one at the exact same location and had adopted the old one's address. The former owners, a couple, had decided to sell it after having lived there for two and a half years because they had inherited a mansion somewhere else. I, of course, had been the one that had bought it over from them very happily. I garnered zero useful info whatsoever from the phone call. The agency told me straight they did not know anything about whoever had owned the previous house, nor the previous house itself. They suggested I talk with the local police, which was exactly what I went on to do. I first inquired about the existence of the two officers. To my surprise and horror, the department revealed those two had indeed been part of their team many years ago before, but refused to further disclose any info regarding how they had left the police force. When I went on to tell them I had received a visit from those two the night before, due to an alleged emergency call from my address I had known nothing about, they confirmed the call was non-existent and decided to send someone over to investigate. Shortly afterward, another pair of officers arrived on my porch. They showed me photos of Officer Blythe and Officer Duchamp. I told them these were indeed the same people I had encountered. They then revealed those two had gone missing nine years before, while answering an emergency call from the house at my address back then, made by the then 52-year-old homeowner, Laurie Randall, about mysterious crawling sounds. When I asked about Laurie, they reluctantly added Laurie had gone missing too, presumably on the same night. They then took my statement and left me with their contact info before taking off. After seeing them off, I finally let the severity of the situation sink in. The two officers were real people, or at least they had been nine years before. Which meant what or whoever had paid me a visit the previous night had not been pranksters, or maybe Rainer and Greg were indeed playing a prank on me. For they disappeared from the police just to play cops as former cops on innocent citizens. In addition, the owner of the old house, Laurie, was or had been a real person as well. A real missing person, just like the other two. I had forgotten to ask the officers for a photo, but I did not think I needed it. This whole thing was fucked. I got my laptop and tried to search for local police or news reports on missing persons cases, but my search came up empty. It seemed like to me they had covered them up. 
I did not think it was because the authorities were somehow involved. I assumed it was because they had details on the case that could potentially upset the community. The police had merely revealed to me what they had felt comfortable to let on. Next, I tried to contact that blog from the previous night, but found out it had not updated for four years. There was only an email address of the blogger on the contact page, and I did not think it would help me to reach anybody. Nonetheless, I sent an email to the address, with zero expectation of getting a reply. The day passed by, with my anxiety and fear culminating as the night fell. However, though alarmed, I was still refusing to humor the idea that I was in any real danger. I am not the superstitious type, and I also told myself I would immediately call the police, should anything even remotely suspicious happen. At 8pm, with all the lights on, I was snuggled in my living room armchair, pretending to aimlessly scroll through all my feeds on various social media platforms, while in reality, nervously paying full attention to each and every slight of imaginary thud and creak in the house. When the night hit 10pm, my usual shower and bedtime, I stood up, stretched my limbs and yawned, ready to call out a day. However, underneath all this normalcy, I was fiercely praying to God no crawling bloody woman would pay me a visit in my slumber tonight, nor any creepy former policeman in real life. I shuffled to the bottom of the stairs and my steps stopped cold. The second floor hallway was pointing over my head like the barrel of a gun, icy and dark. The hallway lights had been turned off. I did not do that. I had deliberately turned on all the lights in my house because I was scared. Frozen with thrumming premonitions in my head, I hesitated about whether to call the police. Some of my lights were mysteriously turned off. Please send help. Would this make a reasonable emergency call? But I promised myself I would call 911 even at the slightest suspicion of danger. Thankfully, my vacillation came to an end after a short moment. The menacing gun barrel of a hallway finally answered my doubt, emanating a noise I had just learned the previous night in my nightmare. The same noise the gutted woman had made when she had tried to maneuver on all fours. If the sound alone was not enough to completely freak me out, the associated visuals popping in my head surely got the job done. Covering my mouth with my hand to stifle a scream, I darted for the front door, but remembering what had happened to Laurie and the two officers on the porch, I stopped myself before turning the doorknob. I probably should have just risked it, but at that moment, I was cornered by the crawling entity and my own concerns and was not thinking straight. So instead of leaving the house, I retreated into the living room, kneeling down behind my sofa which was a pretty useless cover. Lifting the phone to my face, I dialed 911. Something big is crawling in my second floor hallway. The dispatcher offered to stay online with me, but I refused. I had to be able to hear and discern what was going on around me. I could not afford to focus on the phone. As long as the police were coming, I should be fine. A sudden creak, probably from the door on the far end of the hallway, added to the consistent crawling. The thing was entering my bathroom. Good, it's moving away from my side of the house then. But if the article from the previous night served as any reference, the thing was probably moving to the exterior of the house now, so it would be unwise for me to go outside. I then hunched my back and silently sneaked into the kitchen to hide under the large counter. I somehow thought that was better cover. I had also grabbed a kitchen knife before crawling under. What to do now? 
do I just wait here? Or is it really that unsafe to leave the house, get in my car, and gas it? Beads of cold perspiration started roaming my skin. I was yet again caught in indecisiveness. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a flurry of strong knocks on the front door and the shouting from a male voice pulled me out of my dithering. Police, open the door. Thank God, the police are finally here. I was relieved. There is hope now. Then, I remembered I did not hear any police car approaching, and the next sentence from the knocking officer yanked me back to a worsening reality from my transient moment of hope. He said, We are Officer Blythe and Officer Duchamp. Ma'am, you already know us. Please open the door. Or else, we're going to have to smash it. Officer Duchamp chimed in. Both of them sounded playful, even gleeful, like how a chainsaw-wielding serial killer would sound in their game of cat and mouse with the victim. Oh fuck, oh fuck, no! God, please don't let this be real. I was destroyed. I had to bite into my thumb so hard just to stay quiet. Warm tears of desperation welling in my eyes. Loud thuds came from the front door, each one louder than the last. They were ramming the door with their bodies. An explosion of splintering wood erupted in the doorway, with the sound of a human body hitting the ground. Both of them giggled, like a pair of teenage boys at a stupid obscene joke. And one of them was getting up from the ground. I was sobbing by trying hard to hold back sobbing, but they seemed to have not taken any notice. Greg, can you hear that? I think Laurie is still up there in the bathroom. Yeah, that dumbass bitch doesn't know how to open a window without smashing it. How about let's go help out? We'll sweep the first floor later. Your call, boss. Then, I heard footsteps ascending the stairs. I was not even trying to analyze the situation anymore. What would be the use anyway? The only thing I knew was that they left me alone on the first floor, that Laurie was still inside the house, and that the front door was already shattered. So I would be able to walk through it without it creaking. I hastily tiptoed to the door and dashed for my car. However, once at the car, I remembered my key was still lying on the nightstand in my bedroom. Damn. Damn my stupid habit of not having my car key on my person at all times. It would be suicidal to double back and go upstairs. Time was of vital importance. I could not afford to freeze again. So I steered myself into the woods. That patch of the woods serves as a shortcut to the gas station not too far away. It was dark, but I believed I could make it quite easily. I would only need to spend ten minutes in the woods, and I would be in the company of other humans again. Once inside, I inevitably slowed down even though I had my cell phone flashlight on. There was no path in the woods, just untrodden wilderness. I also had to constantly turn back and observe the surroundings to see if anyone was following. I got away a little too easily. Or am I just too scared to feel safe again? The ten minutes walk felt like a ten years march, and I felt like I was trudging in a dark tunnel, insulated from any hope and warmth. However, with each tunnel comes a light at the end. After a decade, I finally caught a glimpse of the distant gas station lights. My instincts told me to scream, to let my voice, traveling at the speed of sound, reach the haven first, so I could at least get a vicarious taste of security and hope, when suddenly, a wet drop landed on the tip of my nose. It smelled like decaying blood, 
more drops followed. Before it dawned on me what was going on, I subconsciously looked up toward the forest canopy. And that is the last thing I remember from yesterday. Right now, I am lying on a patch of grass deeper in the woods. I may not remember exactly how everything ended yesterday, but I still remember all the pain toward the end. That is not important now, though. Now I'm not feeling any pain, nor any comfort either. What am I feeling? Lying here with my throat, my ribcage, and my stomach torn open is a primordial hunger, a yearning out inside me, and a presence not far away. The presence of some young people, teenagers, wondering, exploring nearby, probably in search of some harmless juvenile thrill in the darkening woods. The time on my cell phone says it is dusk outside the woods. Their life energy, delicate yet vibrant, is threading through the shrubs and thickets like a school of fish, luring me into action. I have to put down the phone now, for I have to go satiate my hunger. I do wish I could keep updating you guys on my new, on live. But I am afraid, very soon the animal inside will take over and leave me with but a tiny fragment of my human intelligence. Probably right after this first hunt I'm about to embark on. I wonder who will become the next owner of my house and if the gang, you know whom I am referring to, will eventually come looking for me. Normally, I'm a really quiet person, but the pandemic hit me hard. It hit everyone hard. Like many people, I was found with a lot more time on my hands than anticipated. Sure, a lot of it was spent doing college work, but I soon found myself bored. And I guess a few of my friends did as well, because after much persuasion, I found myself buying the latest horror game for VR. I knew spending money was really bad right now, but I was okay. I had a good savings built up. So when this game came up for the third time, I finally caved and bought the game and headset. The headset was like your typical VR headset. It had straps and the standard goggles that went around your head. There were no extra controllers, which I found a little odd. One of my friends, who we'll call Riley, already had the headset game combo. With much reluctance, we also convinced our friend, who we'll call Cameron. He was very reluctant to get the game at first. It took a bit of bribing to get him to join, but he ended up buying it as well. The first day I played the game was Halloween. And I took off the day from school, silenced my phone, and set up my living room. I sent a quick message in our group chat to make sure the others were ready as well. While I waited for a response, I tied my hair back in a long braid and settled on the couch for some classic YouTube. Finally, both Riley and Cam confirmed they were ready. Navigating to our group chat's voice channel, I set myself up with my headset, sliding it over my head and adjusting the fit. The sound of the others joining the call echoed through the headset speakers. The screen was currently black, as we had agreed that Riley would set it up since he had better internet. I was home due to the virus, and managed to have the night free from my family. Can you guys hear me? I asked tentatively, waiting for their replies. Yes, came Cam's first, followed shortly by Riley. Okay then, I'm ready. The black screen was disorienting, 
and I wanted to get into the game quickly. I heard Riley tap a few keys on his keyboard, and then the screen changed. We were greeted with a generic simplistic loading screen. It displayed the game's author and company name briefly before the effect of the flickering lights turned it off. I hope you guys also turned off your lights, I muttered. It's really dark in here. Yeah, same here, Riley said. I have a nightlight on, but that's about it, Cam admitted, which made me laugh. Of course you'd leave a nightlight on, I teased. Come on, this game can't be that scary. The banter was interrupted by the main menu of the game. Riley quickly tapped a few more keys and created us a lobby. And our characters soon spawned in. We were outside in a truck, with Riley as the driver and myself in the passenger seat. Cam was in the back, peering through the windows. We're in front of the house, he observed. How do you move again? Uh, you kind of just do, Riley said. It's subconscious, really. It's really quite cool, don't you think? Kind of weird, I admitted, testing it out by moving an arm in game. I felt completely submerged in the game. I knew I was standing in my living room, in front of my computer. But it was as if I wasn't consciously aware of my environment outside of the game. It was very disorienting. But I didn't say anything because... I didn't want to chicken out. Earth to Ev. Cam was waving a hand in front of my face. Are you coming or what? The passenger side of the truck was opened, and Riley was already outside holding two flashlights. Sorry, just tired, I lied, carefully exiting the vehicle. Riley handed me the flashlight, which I turned off and on. Then I turned around and looked at the house before us. This map for the game had a farmhouse standing directly in front of us, off a narrow road that was blocked off by some fences. The log cabin was two-story and had a few windows lining the front. The three of us hesitated on the front porch, peering in one of the windows. Well, I'm not going first, Cam admitted. No way. Scaredy cat, I muttered, stepping in front and opening the door. The first thing I noticed was the sound. It was like stepping into a different world, fully submerging myself into the deep end that was this game. I lost all connection with reality, and my focus was the house in front of me. Directly in front of me was a living room. It was small, with a fireplace on the wall to the right, with a big glass window centered in the front. Two flowery, faded curtains lined the window. The living room looked like my grandma decorated it. A worn-looking couch surrounded by two wooden tables. In front of the window was a rocking chair. Exactly the kind of creepy chair you didn't want to find in any haunted house. Next to us, in the door, was a small foyer, with a staircase leading up to the upper floor. Next to the living room was another small hallway that led off somewhere to the right. After taking in the small house, I entered cautiously. My hand brushed a light switch, which made me flinch. Recovering quickly, before either of my friends noticed, and I flicked the switch, and light flooded the small foyer. Let there be light, I exclaimed dramatically, flourishing my hands as if doing some kind of magic trick. Riley rolled his eyes while Cam just laughed at my corny joke. The game was simple. We had to investigate the house, find paranormal evidence, and then we could leave. Any ghost inside had a chance of killing us after a period, but that was fine. It was just VR. We would be able to view our friend's perspective if we died. 
It was just a creepy game that we could turn off at any point, if we got too scared, right? I ventured forward towards the living room. In this game, each of us was equipped randomly with ghost hunting equipment. I had a camera, Cam carried an EMF reader, and Riley had a spirit box to communicate with any ghosts inside. I'll go upstairs, Riley volunteered, slowly creeping up the stairs. The distinctive old house creaks filled the silence as he advanced. Cam opened the door to the left and peered inside. Oh, it's a kitchen. Do you think there's food? How can you eat in VR? I asked. Well, you can try. And with that, I was left alone as he disappeared in search of virtual food. The house had been abandoned for some time. According to the game's description, the owners had just up and left. In the living room, a few magazines were scattered on the coffee table, and the blanket was thrown haphazardly on the couch. Suddenly, the lights in the foyer flickered off. I let out a startled shout against my will as I was once more plunged into the darkness. Cam poked his head out of the kitchen, and I turned to face him. What happened? The light went out. I went forwards towards the lamp, pulling the string. I think the power's out. We were each equipped with walkie-talkies in order to communicate better. I unclipped it from my belt and held the button. Riley, the power's out. Do you know where the switch is? Nope. It's pitch black up here, even with the flashlight. I wonder if the ghost is up here, came his tiny response in the small radio. Probably, I mused. I mean, that's typical for horror games, right? Cam had exited the kitchen, and I followed him to the stairs. I shined my flashlight up the stairs, peering upwards to the landing. It was as if light was sucked up by the infinite darkness, and I shuddered a little. It really is dark up there, Cam said into the walkie, echoing my thoughts. I led the way up the stairs, with Cam shortly behind, and we ascended upwards. The darkness poured around us, as if the shadows themselves were a pool, and we were entering it deeper. Our flashlight beams meandered left and right, until they fell across Riley's form who was posed at a closed door. Guys, he whispered as we approached, there's something in there. Listening quietly, I could hear it. There was a quiet sobbing coming from within the room. Well, that'll do it. There's definitely something in there, I whispered, hoisting up my video camera from around my neck. I pressed a button, and it worked alive. Then, I slowly nudged the door open with my foot. The crying immediately stopped, and I immediately noticed something was wrong, because I could smell it, the god-awful scent of an old musty room, mixed with the smell of rotten meat hit me like a punch to the face. I backed up, bumping into Riley as I retreated from the room. What the hell is that? I shouted as I stumbled backwards. How is that even possible? Somewhere in the distance, I heard a door slam shut, but my brain was too preoccupied with the smell to understand what was happening. Neither replied as were both gagging, retreating further down the hallway until they left me alone in front of the door. I slammed it shut, following them back toward the stairs. The three of us, holding our noses and coughing from the horrific smell, raced toward the front door. 
Cam, who was in the lead of the mad dash to escape, suddenly stopped, causing Riley and I to run into him. I can't open the door, he cried, pulling frantically on the now closed door. Well, let's just take off the headsets, Riley suggested. As if on cue, the three of us reached up to take off our headsets. I could feel my fingers close around the straps, pull them over my head, temporarily disoriented by the darkness in my living room. But instead of being in front of my computer, and I was back in the truck, Riley next to me, with Cam in the back. Hello everyone, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed listening to those creepy stories, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. And hit the notification bell to know when I upload a new video. I just wanted to finish off by saying thank you to everyone who's been watching the videos. It really means a lot that you guys have been watching these. And with that, I'll see you guys in the next video.